All right, my name is Tim Rush. I've been a faculty member in the College of Education uh, since 1982. Uh, my kids grew up here. Um, in fact, uh, I have grandchildren who are probably the same age as some of you in, in this room. Uh, I, I prepared this, uh, this presentation, or at least an early draft of it uh, for last year's uh, symposium and uh, a couple of days before the symposium I was out riding my mountain bike into a stiff wind and I felt something funny and it turned out I was having a coronary a tiny little branch artery of a, of a significant artery that supplies blood to my heart had plugged up and gave me a little discomfort and sent me to the emergency room and uh, prevented my appearance on this stage uh, in 2012. So uh, everything's well, everything's good. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, in, I've always thought I was in really good shape. And what I've learned from my doctors is genetics trumps lifestyle. So um, just because you're a marathon runner doesn't mean you're impervious, uh, doesn't make you bulletproof uh, or made of steel. All right, one family and the mean world. I uh, did some dumb things when I was a kid and uh, skated. The, uh, the, the society of, of the time and uh, the circumstances that I lived in uh, prevented uh, consequences that were uh, suffered by one of my, my children, my son, adopted son, uh, African-American. And uh, it seemed like every time he took a step off uh, the beaten path. He su suffered very severe consequences uh, through the uh, Wyoming court system. My grandson is uh, uh, my grandson. He's 19, 20, enlisted in the Air Force now, and and following a course that I followed. So let's just get into this. I'll tell you right up front that. Uh, The, the impetus for my preparing this presentation was an article in Rethinking Schools and a book by uh, Michelle Alexander that some of you who are here, you're here because you've read this book and you know something about mass incarceration of minority people, especially minority young men in this country. So if you don't know the book, The New Jim Crow, uh, you w you should uh, make yourself familiar with it. You should make yourself familiar with statistics that appear at the uh, uh, the ACLU website and several others uh, that I will uh, refer to as we go along. Um, incarceration in the age of color blindness, and uh, that's a touchy word, color blindness, uh, because it, what it uh, what it connotes is uh, a complete absence of sensitivity to uh, to race, to color. And psychologists will tell you that that's impossible. You know, it's human nature to uh, identify differences. So we can say we're colorblind, but it's uh, uh, probably an exaggeration. Uh, it's what we'd like to think of, of, of ourselves as being uh, tolerant and uh, accepting and respectful and kind to people of all descriptions. But that's, uh, if, if you believe that about yourself, you will come to live that. But it's not as easy as saying the words. Well, you can look at the article in Rethinking Schools, the winter, spring 2010, 2012 article by Linda Christensen, uh, which deals with really classroom to prison pipeline. Okay, and so the, the question I had as I started this was, you know, was the lenient treatment that I got when I was a teenager uh, and borderline, you know, troublemaker uh, in the 1950s, um, due to the attitudes of my community and my neighborhood and uh, um, the kind of extended neighborhood family that I that I grew up in, or um, was it the fact that I was white and privileged? I think maybe both. 
So I'll compare those uh, two those experiences uh, with those of my African American grandson in the 1980s and my uh, white grandson in the 2000 uh, 2000s. Okay. Um, The justice system is now harder on minority white youth than it was on me. I can tell you that right now. And uh, I can tell you, well, I'll show you some, some statistics. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Oh, gosh, if I go too fast, I'll only be here for five minutes, and then you'll get to go home early. And, you know, no college professor would allow that kind of thinking. All right, so um, I've had this cartoon on my door for 10 years, I think. It uh, may be longer. It's, it was published in 1992. The caption reads, uh, you can see what it says on the side of every, uh, every building here in the, in the prison complex. In hindsight, maybe they should have spent more of the state budget on education. Hmm. Uh, we're spending Money. Uh, we're investing money in, in prisons and uh, maintenance of prisons at a much higher rate uh, since 1980 than at any time in our history. In fact, we're probably investing more more in prisons and prison maintenance and prison systems than any country in the world. So here's the basic lesson. If you have to leave early, I thought I'd give you this uh, right up front. Uh, you learn from your environment. In school and community and family, you learn how to make decisions and how to get along in the world from good company. But in prison, you learn that others control you, and you don't get experience making good decisions, and you learn to get along in prison from bad company. While I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, I was a I needed to work. I had a full-time job working in the correction system. And uh, the correction system in Minnesota gave uh, veterans bonus points on the civil service exam to, to do that kind of work. At, uh, at that time, uh, the top score was uh, 100. And I scored 110 because you got a 10-point bonus for being a veteran. You didn't need any real, real experience. So maybe a high school diploma, but I'm not even sure of that. Uh, I think of, of two kids that I knew, one who died tragically when he was uh, just released from the correction system in Minnesota. That was Eddie. And, and Guy, um, had, I met him when he was 16. He had been in a state institution since he was eight, since he was a third grader because his behavior was intolerable to, uh, to the people in school, and he did some dumb things. Uh, so he was taken away from his uh, custodians, his grandparents. And uh, I, I'll tell you more about Guy in a while. He's, he's been imprisoned uh, all his life. I met him in 1968. Okay, so I'm thinking that uh, there is a pipeline. You could call it a classroom to a prison pipeline. But for some kids, the system works like this. It's a system that, uh, that some people call a push-out system or you know, a, a choose-out system. You make bad choices, and, we, and you, we're not responsible for you. You go, first of all, to detention, and then ISS, and then out-of-school suspension and then expulsion, and then the streets, and usually the courts, and then into the correction system. I think there are counselors in the junior highs and middle schools of this state who know kids who have followed that route. Maybe not followed that route, been uh, uh, pushed into that route. Right. You can push people in good and bad ways, but that's, that's a bad way. Well, when you look at kids and youth, boys in particular, because boys are uh, funneled into the corrections system at a much higher rate than girls, something like 15 times as high. 
Well, uh, boys uh, are are affected. Boys of color even more than you know, uh, probably three or four times the rate at least of of, of their percentage in the population. In the general population, um, if uh, in your community the general population of black kids is 10%, then they will be eventually represented in the correction system at about 30%. Well, boys to men, uh, if you look at Alexander's work, she makes this point uh, that, that disenfranchised men result in disenfranchised people. That is, the correction, what happens in the correction system is once you're accused of, or convicted of a felony, you lose your right to vote. You know, you're, you're, usually your state governor has, uh, the, uh, only, is the only authority to, to reinstate your, your voting rights. And uh, that doesn't often happen. So uh, when we talk about Jim Crow or the denial of uh, voting rights and uh, citizenship to black people, that's against the law. But it's not against the law to put uh, to incarcerate young black men for nonviolent crimes and therefore uh, put them in prison and, and uh, take away their right to vote and therefore their their community's influence over what happens to the to the community well uh, i've since early in my career my career started as an educator in uh, 1969 uh, early in my career i came across the work of william glasser um, Reality Therapy was a book that was influential to me because I worked with very difficult kids. Kids who uh, uh, would have been expelled from the education system, but we had an alternative school where I, where I was a teacher. Anyway, uh, Glasser identifies in later books five basic human needs. He says we all need safety and sustenance, love and belonging, power or influence, choice, freedom, and fun. And he pointed out early in, you know, in, in those early works that I read that school and prison had a lot in common in terms of uh, providing for those essential human, basic human needs. Uh, safety and sustenance, well, pretty good, but you could argue uh, that that's negative. Love and belonging in, in school, uh, pretty rare. Power and influence, who decides what you get to do in school? In general, yeah, the administration or the teachers decide. They certainly decide what books you're going to read, what books you're going to learn to read from. Um, uh, freedom, pretty, pretty restricted by the bell. Right? And fun. Uh, well, if you can learn, as, as we did, everybody in this room has learned that learning is fun, right? It's an uplifting kind of thing. So uh, we are, compared to many of the kids we teach, freaks. You know? We derive joy out of something that, uh, that they don't. Uh, the word joy always makes me think of, of Myron Tribus, who is a disciple of the guru of quality education and quality uh, organization uh, in the well in in the time from World War II until about 1995. His name was W. Edwards Deming, and Deming was a graduate of this institution. Uh, he grew up in Powell, Wyoming, and became uh, one of the most influential people in the world. Resurrected the uh, the post-war uh, industries of Japan, of many countries in Europe, of Russia, of uh, of the new nation of Israel, said that uh, I'm going to. Well, let me let me just say what he said. It, the, the manager's job is to discover and remove the barriers that prevent the workers from finding joy in what they do. 
The manager's job is to discover and remove barriers that prevent, prevent people from finding joy in what they do. So what's the teacher's job? To discover and remove the barriers that prevent children from finding joy in learning. Yeah. It's, it's something I refer to in my classes, but I think if over my career, if I had made that my major goal, uh, children would be better off. The teachers I taught would be would be better off. Well, the, my point is uh, in, in in analyzing schools and prisons. You, you know, kids are much more likely to uh, to to find these needs being met in gangs or in their families than they are in school or in prison, right? I think the message for you is, uh, you know, how can we uh, enable kids to ha be self-actualizing enough to, to get their, their basic needs met? Glasser said in, an, in another book uh, he's published probably 20 or 30 books, but he said in one of them that, that if, uh, if I encounter someone that I consider to be really messed up, if you encounter, Alan, someone that you consider to be really messed up, they are not getting their needs met in at least two of those areas. Yeah, so if you look at the kids in your classroom who or who seem to uh, have, be having the most difficulty, if you knew something about their lives, you might be able to determine what their, what their needs are that you can help to address. Okay, let's go on with the story here. If I can, did that switch? It didn't, there we go, okay. All right, so I'm going to show you the Rush Boys. Uh, and, and, and the question in looking at these pictures is, which of these boys, these young men, uh, will experience difficulty or which will, for which will life turn out all right? Okay, here's one. You know who that is. And here's Tobias. And this is Walter. So if you look at those three pictures, uh, what and you say to yourself, okay, uh, if I if I profile these guys, which one? Okay, is life going to turn out all right? What would you say looking at this in 1963? You think? Okay. And this guy. Happy, cheerful, you know, looks pretty smart. And this guy, actually, I'm a little older than these two when these picture were, pictures were taken, but they were both about 16 when those pictures were taken. Right. And uh, I've had people say, well, he's a scruffy looking kid, he's probably going to have some trouble. Right. Whereas, um, This guy's pretty cheerful and looks uh, looks like he's got it together, and uh, he looks like a troublemaker, All right. doesn't he? It's okay. You can be honest. Yeah. All right. Well, in fact, uh, we'll 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 get into that. I, I think in this uh, presentation, I'm I'm thinking about. Uh, Fear versus social justice, and a lot of the decisions and policies that are in effect in the world and in this country and in this community and in schools today are, uh, are related to fear that, that uh, things are going to go bad. Right? So if you, look, if you were to look at uh, George Gerbner's uh, work, there are some pretty good video documentaries on, on his life, and, and his books were uh, tremendously inter interesting. He, he said, uh, you know, watching a lot of violent television will not make you a violent person. But if you watch a lot of things that have violence in them, it will make, you, make your attitude toward the world change. You'll see the world as mean and threatening and cruel 
and dangerous. And that's going to affect your behavior. Uh, I think our, our, our policies uh, on the, our laws are more and more based on the notion that we are afraid that bad things are going to happen, especially uh, go back to the, the war on drugs, which began about 1980. And some of the things that were said in Congress and by the president and the president's wife uh, about uh, you know, how we've got to eradicate drugs because they are the most dangerous thing to our society. Well, uh, I kind of think of that Jimmy Buffett song, uh, The Freddy Cat World. If you're not familiar with that, you know, you probably will get a bang out of it. Um, uh, John Phillips is a is an editor at at Car and Driver magazine. You know, I read a lot of different stuff. You know, uh, and uh, he started an article on our our our, our penchant for alarm when the, uh, there's a, an automobile recall. Right, and he said he starts the article with this: Americans love to wet their pants, you know, to be afraid, to be, you know, oh, tense, and, you know, then run and tell your neighbor or, or your mom or your dad, you know, what terrible thing has just happened. There's another song that, uh, that I didn't work into this presentation, at least when I went through the notes before I came over from my office, uh, by Chris Christopherson that I think uh, helps explain a lot of what's going on in society. Do you know the song, Jesus was a Capricorn? You know, he ate organic food. He believed in peace and love and never wore no shoes. Long hair, beard, and sandals, and a funky bunch of friends. I reckon if he came back down, they'd nail him up again. Because everybody has to have somebody to look down on. Someone to feel better th than at any time they choose. Listen to that. Uh, it's it, you know in the age of iTunes, it's a click away. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we have gone through the law and order, get tough on crime, war on drugs. Again and again, uh, what what I perceive is that fear sells, hate sells too. It's much easier to rally people around war than around the peace movement. Right. They rally around hate and fear. Uh, politicians, uh, we have uh, more and more liberal laws on guns in, sp in spite of the fact that uh, you know, we have these mass shootings occurring almost with regularity, you know, almost in the same places. Now, by the way, uh, you know, Colorado has uh, adopted some pretty strict laws, and they did it a long time ago. But an interesting thing is happening in Denver right now, uh, where the, the, uh, the Denver public schools and the law enforcement people have agreed that uh, they will analyze every report in terms of whether it's a discipline problem, a school misbehavior problem, or uh, a crime. And in Massachusetts, it's just the opposite. Right. They, have, they have a law that, that says that misbehavior in school will be treated as a crime. Now, I'm not going to define that for you, but uh, the kinds of things that, that uh, kids do stupidly, uh, you know, fighting on the playground, you know, punching somebody, that's criminal behavior in Massachusetts, apparently. Even in middle school. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mass incarceration, we'll get into uh, in a second, uh, uh, rates of uh, incarceration uh, internationally the, in the U.S., adult and youth, r by race and ethnicity. All of those data are available to anyone who's curious uh, with a click of a mouse. I would, you know, you could start with Wikipedia and what they say about mass incarceration. And we will go to some of the references there. Uh, one of the trends that uh, I just learned this afternoon at the uh, ACLU website where I read the, their report on uh, uh, incarceration 
um, from 2011 is that Wyoming consistent, consistently incarcerates youth at a higher rate than any other state in the nation. Years ago now, uh, the, the Laramie Albany County Detention Center was opened, I think, around 1995, maybe around 2000. <clears throat> and it was a, you know, it was a beautiful new building, uh, very secure. By that time, my son had spent time on the third floor of the courthouse, uh, you know, in a cell adjacent to, you know, where the adult population was, right, as a 14-year-old kid because he strayed into somebody's uh, a friend's house and took some records without asking. And uh, that was reported. And once it was reported, you can't back out of, a, of a, in this state anyway, you can't, once you've accused somebody uh, and uh, started the, the legal machinery working, you can't withdraw your charges. So that goes forward. Anyway, uh, you know Warren Lauer perhaps is a, a member of the, of the University of Wyoming Board of Trustees, lawyer in town. We were working together in a community service project at the time, and he said, mark my words, Tim, as soon as that detention center opens, the juvenile crime rate in Laramie will quadruple. Now, why would that be? Why would it be? That's right. They have room for them. They have to justify the expense of the millions of dollars spent on the new detention center. Uh, a tragic thing. Uh, when the war on, uh, on crime and war on drugs began in the 1980s, uh, my son was just, you know, becoming a juvenile. Uh, turns out maybe a juvenile delinquent, but uh, like a lot of people of color, he, men, young men of color, he was caught in that machinery. He was, uh, he was always treated more harshly than any of the white kids he got in trouble with. Okay, uh, what else did I want to say here? Okay. Yeah, these are these are my words. You, you can, if you quote anything here, note that uh, this is this is my take. That juvenile justice in reality translates as more crime equals increased funding for police and public and privatized and privatized. I should have enlarged that print because privatized prisons have been expanding and they have a huge lobby in Washington. I'm not sure how, how we would say it was big in Wyoming, but uh, prisons run uh, by private corporations in the same way that the post office is run uh, or the postal service is run are more and more prevalent. More cells equals more crime because we learn from each other. That is, the people in jail learn misbehavior from, me, from each other. Albany County crime rate increased in order to fill and justify the new detention center. That's true. Okay, so this is, a, this is something that I learned as a correctional officer uh, in the state of Minnesota 40 years ago, and I learned it from 14, 13, 14, and 15-year-old kids. How do you tell if it is safe to break into a house? We're all educated people. Do you know the answer to that question? You'd have to guess, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, these 13 and 14 year olds learn from each other that the, e the easiest way to tell if it's okay to break into a house is to throw a rock through the window. And if nobody comes out or no alarm goes off, go on in, take what you want. Huh? In the 60s, you know, how do you get into a garage without breaking a window or door locks? I'm thinking to myself, now, this is what they're going to remember of all the things I said, <laughs> right? Well, <clears throat> with electric garage door, door openers, uh, in the 60s anyway, you could just reach down and grab the handle and raise the door. There was no, no locking mechanism to keep it closed. And, you know, a lot of people in the 60s didn't have electric garage door openers, and they didn't really lock them. 
So you just grab the handle and then you've got to, you can back your, your buddy's pickup truck up to the door and make a haul. All right. Uh, <clears throat> you can look at uh, Wikipedia. This is just one example that I, that I put up, but there's uh, a website uh, uh, World Rates of in Incarceration. Uh, there's a there's a British website that uh, that is probably the, if you said uh, incarceration rates in a Google search it would be about the first one that came up and it would give for statistics for every uh, nation with a correctional system on this planet. Okay, you, the United States of America has the highest rate of incarceration, uh, 738 per 100,000. Some states have a higher rate than that. Followed by Russia, which uh, some people think of as a uh, pretty uh, totalitarian state, maybe even not, uh, maybe a, in the last couple of years I think we would consider them as, uh, as a top tier nation in terms of, in terms of economic development. But Some people would think of it as uh, maybe like a third world nation in terms of social development. Uh, other nations, St. Kitts, I'm not even sure where that is. Nevis, I'm not sure where that is. Yeah, have, okay. okay. They have high incarceration rates, but, you know, seem, seemingly they would be uh, fairly impoverished in third world countries. U.S. Virgin Islands, 521, well, they're related to us, so they ought to have a, a high rate, but still a lot lower than, than main, mainland America. Turkmenistan, Belize, Cuba, China's rate of incarceration is only 118 per 100,000 people. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's because uh, you get capital punishment for shoplifting, right? So they're people who, who break laws are, are dispatched rather than imprisoned. No. Um, there are more resources on, online as far as these data or data like these uh, than, uh, than I can possibly list. I've listed a few at the end of this presentation. And by the way, you know, my email address is timrush at uwyo.edu, and uh, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, you can get it. I guess, uh, Cody, this is being streamed, is that right? Okay. And archived, so, yeah, if you want to quote me precisely, there you go. All right. Okay, the rate of incarceration in this uh, country, in the United States, was stable until the 1980s. So if you, if you looked at, uh, I don't, I can't get to the website, but uh, on the Wikipedia website, it shows that since, uh, since the year 1900 until 1980, the, pr the rate of incarceration increased at about, it was almost stable, almost level. And then in 1980, with the war on drugs and uh, three strikes and you're out and, and laws like that, the rate went like that. So it was flat, very, very stable until 1980, and then almost a, you know, a J-curve increase in incarceration. Okay. Half of all U.S. prisoners are serving time for nonviolent crimes. Most of the, the drug convictions were nonviolent crimes. Uh, at, an, at an increasing rate, prisons are being privatized, taken over by for-profit organizations, businesses, and experts like the ACLU say, well, you know, if, if you can make money by putting more people in jail, then it, it's in your best interest to pass more laws that will put more people in, people in jail. So the lobby that the private, uh, private prisons 
have in Washington is, uh, is significant and powerful. It relates back to that fear principle. You know, if you can make, make people afraid that bad things are going to happen unless they spend more money on prisons, they will spend more money on prisons. 70% of U.S. prisoners are, are members of racial minorities. 13% of black men cannot vote because of criminal convictions. Youth of colored, color are jailed at twice the rate of white youth. This, this is an interesting thing that sociologists have, have, have brought to our attention, that cocaine sentences, sentencing penalties uh, are the same. I mean, the, the, the penalty is the same if you have 100 grams of powder cocaine what some people call white man cocaine. It's expensive stuff. As they are for five grams of crack, which is, you know, considered uh, for, you know, the cheap, poor people, people of color, would be more inclined to have if they're crack users uh, or they're cocaine users, crack. And if they have five grams of that, they get the same penalties as if as I would if I were in possession of 100 grams, 100 grams of, co of cocaine. All right, so the, you know, the poor and de facto, uh, poor and de facto men of color are the crack prisoners and there are lots and lots of them. So let's look at 50 years of memories. I, I said I would talk about my personal experience. So, all right, so, uh, I think related this this statement trusted judgment to zero tolerance relates to the role of uh, law enforcement people in the lives of my friends and I when I was a kid when I was uh, you know before 1960 I was born in 1942 so here's uh, that was the car I I bought uh, at near the end of my senior year Right, the 1950 Mercury uh, two-door uh, coupe. This isn't the identical car, but it uh, it uh, shows you what uh, what I drove around in with my friends on Friday and Saturday nights, and I call it the beer cooler 1960 because one of the previous owners, who was likely you know not likely, he was a guy in his early 20s, had gone into the back seat. There was an armrest that was. Uh, over the uh, the fender well, and it was it was uh, steel, right? It was like a steel compartment. He had uh, made an opening in the top of the armrest, peeled off the upholstery, made an opening in the top of the armrest, and uh, it was a perfect beer cooler. And when we drove down the streets uh, uh, on Friday nights. Our, uh, our car looked like a milk truck. Remember those? Where they had ice inside to keep the milk cool? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's the kind of uh, kid I was, right? <laughs> Behavior and consequences then and now. Uh, or is it uh, white and brown? Uh, Parallel episodes, I'll get into those. A playground fight in 1954. Uh, I <coughs> fought with a, with, a, with a kid, and they said, you know, he was bigger than me, and they said, you got up 11 times. I remember getting up once. All right? uh, the incident was, uh, was never reported to the police. Uh, even though I went to the hospital as a consequence of it with, you know, something like migraine headaches, uh, it never became an issue of, of law enforcement. It was something that kids did at that time. You know, if, if somebody bullied you, the idea was to get in his face and don't let him do that again. Right? Uh, pretty dumb advice, really. But that's, that's the way it was. Uh, in another instance, after school, I was in a fight. I was, a, I think I was a seventh grader. 
And the boy that I fought with, I was an eighth grader, the boy that I fought with and I bloodied each other for about a half an hour on the school premises, surrounded by a circle of students and teachers who were cheering us on. Finally, the assistant principal came out and said, you guys get out, get out of here, go, go off. So we fought from the school two blocks down to the front of a business, I, I think it was Sakura's Plumbing. And old man Sakura came out and says, this is baloney, you guys knocked this off. And he took us up to the drugstore and bought us both a soda. And we became friends after that. Yeah. But, uh, in 1984, my son was at a uh, University of Wyoming football game. He was 12. And he was being antagonized by a 16-year-old kid and ended up fighting with him. And they, uh, they were both uh, grabbed by the police and taken down to the station. And they both received uh, community service penalties, right? Even though you know, my son was 12, his adversary was 16, and, uh, and Toby didn't start the fight. That was the beginning of, uh, of a tailspin, I think, uh, because even as a 12-year-old, he, he could say, this isn't fair, right? And he began to get a little, uh, more than a little rebellious. In 1955, um, some friends and I uh, did something stupid and, you know, after hours went into a store and were, you know, helping ourselves to things. The little old ladies who owned the store uh, reported us to our parents, not to the police, and uh, we made restitution, which is, there, that's a concept also from William Glasser's work, restitution, that if you do something stupid to somebody else, you have to make amends. Right. You know that. Okay. Uh, well, the beer in the back seat. Uh, uh, well, in 1990, uh, my son went to jail, you know, in the back seat of a, of a squad car because there were cases of beer in the trunk of a car that he was riding in. In 1960, I was driving, my friends were drinking beer, I was driving down a country road when uh, the flashers went off. There was a squad car, a highway patrolman was behind us. Right? Oh, everybody was, well, you know how you get nervous. I pulled off slowly onto the shoulder of the road. My friend Terry opened the door slowly and pushed the button so that the overhead light wouldn't go on. And while the policeman walked around to talk to me, Terry put the beer on the ground outside the car and closed the door. The officer said, uh, you know, you guys probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. It's late. You don't need to be out here. Why don't you just pack up and go home? So we said, yes, sir, yes, sir, we'll do that. We did. Went down the road about a half a mile, turned around, came back to get our beer, and it was gone. Yeah. Well, I, th I think uh, if that were to happen today or even in 1990, uh, we would have been run in. I'm not sure, though. As I said, my son would, would, would have, uh, being African-American, he would do something stupid with four or five other white guys who were his friends from school here in town. And uh, uh, he would go to Warland while they went home to their moms and dads. Hmm. And I thought, you know, I'm a white dad. And he's got a white mom. You know, why, why can't he be put into our custody? And I thought of it as an insult or an indictment of me. But in fact, I think it had more to do with his skin color than uh, anything else. That and the fact that, you know, have you ever met somebody who when they're uh, being chewed out there, you know, if you're a teacher, you've, you've met kids like this. They're, they're being chewed out and they smile at you. Yeah. It's a nervous thing. You know, any psychologist could have told Judge Donald down here that, you know, this is a typical behavior of a kid who's, who's really feeling bad. But uh, there was nobody to tell him that, and he didn't know. So the boy went to Orland, where he uh, continued 
received his education in the company of bad people. Okay, uh, back then, uh, you know, if you were given a choice, if you did something dumb, you could go to uh, the uh, you could go to the Marine Corps, or you could go to uh, uh, in Minnesota it was Red Wing. Here it would be Warland, or maybe worse. Uh, in both of those cases, you, if it's in the military, you're learning from your peers and you're learning from the system. But it's a different kind of learning than you get when you're in confinement, when you're in the correction system. Well, college and career versus corrections uh, spiral. I think that uh, we're just get now getting into uh, what uh, college and career readiness means. Um, I'm not sure it's going to keep that orientation or that opportunity will keep kids out of the correction system. But I'm, uh, I'm hopeful because I don't see in, in the kids that I know, in the kids that I've known since the 1960s, improvement brought on by being incarcerated. Look at recidivism rates. By the way, in Wyoming, we, we don't have any evidence of uh, uh, the, the uh, variable effects of incarceration versus, uh, versus other uh, kinds of what, corrections of treatment for youth. We don't keep statistics on that. So we can't say that uh, um, recidivism is higher for kids who are put into uh, the, sit the school at Warland or into jail compared to those who are put in treatment. Makes me wonder. Well, I think there are real advantages to keeping kids in the community. And I think that we all know that there are agencies and institutions in our committee, in our community that can help, that can help. Uh, you know, I, I never realized uh, that I had many advantages uh, as a white male until it was, I, I was made to think about the advantage that I, that I have ha had. Um, just because of, uh, you know, uh, accidents of birth. That my, I was telling a group yesterday morning, I, I never considered as a graduate student at Purdue University that the fact that I was a white male gave me advantages over women and over minority people, right? Blacks, Hispanics. But I had those advantages, and any woman who, or, or, or minority man who had been in the, in, at Purdue with me could tell you that they looked over their shoulders a lot. Right? That there was no guarantee that their gender or their race wouldn't be counted against them by certain members of their graduate committees. Yeah, Purdue was a place in, in, early, in the early 60s that uh, was just like the University of Wyoming, that black kids, Indian kids, Japanese kids were routinely beaten by white students, thugs, who were students on this campus and at the Purdue campus. You can find people in this community who, and in the, in the native community uh, in in Ethity, for example, that will tell you about their experiences. I know a, a Japanese man and a Arapaho man who, who hung together very tight because they needed to defend themselves if they were coming back to the dormitory or going to their residence during the, during the evening hours. Okay. Well, let me tell you about the, the chloridite, chloridite herd. For two or three years, in the mid uh, 2000s. I worked with uh, the BLM and with some people who were trying to uh, 
what gives sanctuary to about 500 wild horses. And this has nothing to do with the 500 horses, but there's a story of a herd of white horses in Utah called the Chlordite herd. And the Chlordite herd is, uh, is famous for two reasons. They're white horses. And something happens to them as a, as a herd. And, and members of the herd, as they age, go blind. This, I guess I've known this all my life, but white horses have a tendency to go blind because there's no pigment around their eyes to absorb the sun's rays, right? or deflect the sun ray, sun's rays. Anyway, they go blind, right? but they hang together as a herd. And I've, John Gores is a friend of mine who's been a principal all over Wyoming for all of his, seems like all of his career, but here's what he said. That in the chlordite herd, two sighted horses will, will travel with a blind horse. And they, as they go down the ro road at a walk or a trot or a canter, they will nudge the blind horse onto the trail. Good company, right? They will, you know, can you imagine horses doing that for each other? Can you imagine people doing that for each other? I mean, instead of, of rounding them up and putting them in pens, you know, maybe we could uh, nudge them into places where uh, they ought to be. Well, the chlordite herd, I've, I've tried to document this with web searches and I've never been able to do it. But, but John Gores knows the story and he's worked with the BLM in Utah and, and actually witnessed this with his wife, who's a teacher in, uh, in Riverton. At least I th think they're still teaching. They're in my age group, see, or a little a few years younger. And the thing that tends to happen when you get to my age is that uh, the, the, your friends retire, right? Like they say, I've, I've had enough of this. But maybe, you know, part of that is, you know, I th think about retirement once in a while. And one of the, one of the things I think about is, all the people that owe me favors are gone. And I can't go to the president and say, hey, you remember when? Can't do that anymore. No. Huh. Well. Anyway, I hope that my grandsons' will uh, mis mistakes will be treated like mine were, by, pe by kind and respectful and understanding people, uh, and not the way Tobias's experience evolved. Well, you can see that my, my uh, proofreading skills are, are lacking. Uh, in the last three decades, government investments on the war on drugs and wars on crime have brought useful behavior of my day into the realm of criminal behavior and ruined the lives of millions of people. For young men of color and poverty, the effects of these national policies and state policies and community policies have been devast devastating, but the national one is the one I'm focusing on here. Politically, the denial of voting rights to millions of men of color has what? Liz? Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of their of their group, right? That if, well, if I'm Northern Arapaho, and I vote, my community votes, but 13 to 30 percent of us can't vote because we've been convicted of a crime, then our political power is diminished greatly, locally and at the state level and nationally. And that's what Michelle Alexander argues in this, in this book. If you, if you watch uh, free speech TV, if you've got that on your cable or satellite service, uh, once in a while lately they've been running a documentary in which her work is um, explained. 
and I, I think that would be it would be worth as as well not as much as the book, but it would be worth seeing because it uh, it gives you an emotional kind of connection through the visual images. All right. So I've cited Alexander's work, the American Civil Liberties Union, and incarceration in the United States, which is you know people criticize Wikipedia, but it's a good place to start. And uh, in this case, I'm, I'm confident because of their sources that, that they're not exaggerating and not bending the truth or leaving anything out. Uh, the International Center for Prison Statistics, the world prison population list, is the one I cited partially early in my talk. Uh, the Justice Policy Institute uh, describes the punishing decade of the 1990s, uh, prison and jail estimates at the millennium. And then the little article that uh, kind of stimulated me to think about talking with a group of people about this subject was in Rethinking Schools. It was called Classroom to Prison Pipeline. Right. Okay, so thank you for listening. Now, do you have any questions or, uh, or comments? Liz? I, it was in existence when I was a kid. Yeah, and, and, you know, so you can't. You lose your right to bear arms. You lose your 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 right to uh, to vote. Um, um, not, I I'm not an expert. I I, I imagine it's been contested, but uh, it, it's not been overturned. Kind of like the end of class, bangs are zipping, coats are going on. Victoria? For decades. And so, what would you suggest? I mean, you know, is it 12 year old, 13 year old, they do something dumb? And well, and then, then it just spirals into this this thing. And, uh, yeah. Well, my son's my my. Well, let me let me go back. It is possible to have your record as a juvenile expunged, but you need to approach that through legal process. I mean, you have to hire a lawyer and go back in and do that. Problem is if uh, my son and some of his associates are, are examples that <clears throat> because you're a felon, the big impact isn't on your voting rights or your right to bear arms. It's on your ability to get a job. Right? And there are organizations, uh, you know, social welfare organizations. But major churches like the LDS Church and the Catholic Church offer programs uh, to to get felons back into the workforce and give them uh, job skills and counseling and, and help them with uh, with addictions. Uh, that's a that's a that's an important service, but it's hard to get people to take advantage of it, right? Because they're used to getting the door slammed in their faces. They only know, you know, Toby knows how to get along fine when he's in custody. But how to make good choices on your own, how to act independently, you know, that's something I, you know, I, I told him, told me, you know, you, you, you're sick, you're 40, but you're really 16. You know, you've been, half of your life has been, uh, been controlled by other people. And so naturally you make stupid choices. I'm not excusing the stupid choices, but I understand them. Yeah. Bern? When I think of the of your presentation as well as the book, um, I think it's something like thirty percent of black men in Alabama can't vote because they're felons. I think that's Jim Crow. I mean that's what that is. I think of that whole phenomenon. We don't have a lot of racial lynchings anymore. You don't hear about black men being hung up and, and you know as a way to intimidate whole communities, to control whole communities. But what we have is this legal lynching. We have, if you have a person in your school who doesn't like black people, they can make sure that they 
get pushed out, uh, getting on that track that you described, the, the push out track. Uh, if you have a, a cop who doesn't like Hispanic people, same thing. They have the power to do that. And the, and the laws, the zero tolerance policies, the, the war on drug policies, just make it that much easier. All you have to have is one mean, you know, racist cop. And, uh, it's a it's a, it's a legend. And, and it's tolerated. You know, schools and communities, to, uh, school communities tolerate well, that. Well, it could be. It could be. Uh, I have a vivid memory of my son as a 13-year-old. He was still in school at the junior high school. Went to a basketball game. I went to pick him up, and I remember a, a teacher grabbing him by the arm, male teacher grabbing him by the arm, taking him out between the doors, you know, at the outside, at the entrance, slamming him up against the wall. And I could read his lips. I hate you, you little son of a bitch. You know. Yeah. And uh, then he went back in and, and did his this teacher thing. So, you know. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, you're listening to one guy talk here, and, you know, my, my views are my own, and, and, and yet I've tried to bring some uh, uh, larger perspective to all of this uh, with statistics, but like I, I learned a long time ago, people like to hear the statistics, but they also like to hear the stories. So there you go. Anybody else? Yeah, Liz? Learning about test scores, I, I, I don't remember where I read it, but there's going to be more pressure to expel kids that aren't meeting the grade. And, yeah, 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 get them out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that might even be more tragic. Kids haven't done anything, but, but uh, you know. It's always been true that we we do fine with as, as education system with 75% of the kids, and 25% of them are challenging, and it's the best of us who can deal with them. So um, maybe we should just focus on 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 that group rather than on you know raising test score averages to a higher level. They must have a bunch of mailboxes. And he said the same thing. If he had been a, a black kid or an American kid, he would have ended up in prison and not a senator. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and yet you said Wyoming has some of the highest incarceration rates, you know. The highest. The highest for use. Uh, we we put kids behind bars at a higher rate than any other state in the union, at least according to 2011 statistics. So. Well, I can't say. Uh, you know, if there is, I should be part of it, shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good weekend. Thanks.